So with uh, wisdom, with insight, wisdom, we really take on the changeability, the anicca, the constant dynamic of experience. And it's really not a thing, but a process of like clouds moving, water moving, constant shifting at any particular point that you acknowledge is rather like the point on a wave. Like, you know, it's really not a separate thing at all. It's just one particular point that your attention is catching on a wave. And when there's a clinging, then of course that point seems to be very stuck. <clears throat> And we look to find, uh, something in the mind looks to find a point to hold on to, to create stability in the wave. Actually, the greatest stability is to widen one's understanding, one's perceptions, one's awareness, to be that which knows the wave moving through, because that's a greater stability than holding on to a particular point in a flowing process, because that point must change and shifts and moves how much we want it to be one way or don't want it to be another way, it must change. And if it's not changing, it means there's a, there's a stuck, <coughs> there's clinging, there's feeding on, there's taking, resisting to, and so on. And there's stress, and that. So what does it take to allow things to arise? Feeling, perceptions. Mm. What's necessary to be able to accommodate the arising experience? What kind of grounding or foundation is necessary to be able to meet the arising experience without getting thrown thrown out in it or you know clinging to it and this is what our what our practice is around just building up that uh, the resources of uh, a reference point so your body your breathing so we're beginning to get some sense of something we can be with while the mental processes move, shift and change. Mm. Simple. Something you can do, your feet, your back, your something is not actually part you know, you get some reference to it. Through so sati, mindfulness of body, mindfulness of breathing and so on. Mm. And these are just <coughs> conventions and uh Techniques and vantage points uh, that enable us to keep coming back to the wisdom of allowing things to rise and pass, moving through. So what does it take? And uh, the results of that, to my sense, there's a almost inevitable transformation that takes place over time. Yeah. Quickly, slowly, but it's almost inevitable. You, you Eventually your mind has to, begins to get the point. It has to come to that place of being aware of processes, you know. You can't, it gives up trying to find something to hang on to because all of that is suffering. And the movement is towards being that knowing or that field of awareness you know, through which things change, arise and pass. Because mm-hmm. it's not a point. You know, the psychology of clinging is that if we could find the right point to hold on to, we'd feel stable and secure. Right, the right place, the right person, the right 
thought, the right idea, the right structure, the right technique, the right da 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 da, get onto that, we'd be, I'd be safe and solid and things would work. But the problem, <laughs> and yeah, it doesn't seem to happen, does it? Because the very sense of I am, an identification, the I am, the identification, is inherently false. It can't find a stable place because itself isn't stable. As I am is the agency, the intention comes and goes, and the I am is also the result, it happens to me. So you know, there's two or three things that can happen in that I am experience. The agent, the immediate, is ha- you know, this is happening to me, and the overall global sense, this is my life, I'm this kind of a person, the self. All of those are inherently unstable. So you can't, there can't be a, a way of making them stable because they themselves are not stable, it doesn't matter what you put them on, whatever you identify with. The identification, which is the whole thing about grasping, clinging, give me something. Well, that me can never actually hold anything because it's innately unstable and leaky. No matter how much water you put in the bottom of the bucket, if it doesn't have a bottom to it, it's going to go right through. And the nature of this self-convention is it's, it's... Empty, it's bottomless, it has no bottom. No matter what you put in it, it falls through. So, you, you know, so the clinging is really the idea of something that will make me solid. Yeah, we'll try walking on water, it might be easier <laughs> than trying to make a self solid. But it's very much the strong, the, the strong inclination, the bawa, is towards being something. Mm-hmm. There's no stability. If you want stability, you have to give up being anything. Mm-hmm. To give up being uh, able to not feel things or feel things. Feelings come and go, they happen, but they don't happen to me. Yeah. You can't complain like that, you know. Things happen, things, feelings arise, do they, do they arise, do they happen to me, or do they just arise? And, uh, you know, it's quite a you know, certain amount of it is just stuff blowing through, and some of it, oh, this is happening to me, and you know, there's a feeling of agitation or excitement around that. That's that's the place where you want to... Who's that? It's clinging. It's suffering. Mm-hmm. And what does it take to come to those places where there is some agitation, some excitement, some disappointment, some... And come to that place, a sensation, a feeling, an assumption, it's happening to me, it shouldn't be this way, and my life is ruined, it's going to be really wonderful in the future. And then all that ripple. Who's that? So you're opening your awareness to that. And you're, yeah, that's feeling. Uh, often what we want to do is to get rid of the feeling and have the me who's not feeling that strange feeling. That can't happen. What you can, what can happen is that you can have the feeling and not the me. You can't have the me and not the feeling. <laughs> the bodies feel. Feelings arise. Chitta feels. That's its nature. 
That's how come. That's the way we, it is. You can't dispense with that. But if you really have that ability of found a foundation, work with the stories, the self, until it becomes the story, doesn't it? When the immediate feeling of the moment becomes, oh, I will be, I was, what can I do, what should I do, how was I, why am I, how long does it take, and so on. That's when it becomes myself. And then it becomes deeply, uh, more deeply embedded, and there's the feeling associated with that sense of stuckness or, yeah. You know, how do I get out? You don't get out because that self is a, is already it's it's a manifestation of stuckness. But you know we come to that. Okay, how who's this? What really is happening here? Pressure, waning of sadha, waning of confidence. Loss of energy, agitation, doubt, so forth. Uh huh. Yeah, that's that. That's true. We all get that. That's true. But, yeah, we, okay. And then the more you begin to really, you know, approach it as it really is, then those various factors that generate the sense of self can begin to recede, pass, dissolve. It's like a gradual dissolving. And it may be the first thing is just that sense of I am stuck. Can we come to that? Oh, the stuck sense, how is that? Well, you know, what's that? Perception. What helps us to, what helps the mind to approach that? To handle it with objectivity, handle it with sensitivity, breathing through that, not resisting it, not favoring it, not adding more to it. And by the not feeding in that way, it dies dies down, dies away. So remember also that upadana clinging is sometimes translated as feeding. It's an involuntary feeding, but that gives one a certainly a good way of looking at it because you feed something, it survives. You don't feed it, it doesn't survive. Hmm. And clinging, grasping, if you hold something, it becomes harder. If you open up about it, it tends to, the clinging tends to unravel. So these are just kind of, you know, things that we do, work on. And often we feed things unconsciously by a sense of self. Like, I am this way, I'd like to be another way. Well, you've added an another I am to it. That's more food, isn't it? So whenever we come in with the I, I am, however non-verbal that is, I want to be another way, then we're actually unconsciously putting more food in the mouth of clinging because the I am is the cling, the clung experience, clung to experience. And the mind holds onto a point. And in terms of meditation, you know, like uh, focusing practice, you know, points and fields. You now, say you're just making a practice out of um, arising and passing. Mm-hmm. So, 
when we deliberately do things, what happens before we go into that? What happens? We decide to get up, we decide to drink something, you know, all that. No, just pausing, noting, arising of intention. And what comes along with that? Is it happy? Is it joyful? Is it worried? Is it whatever? Fresh rise. What, what's there with that intentionality? Is that helpful? Is that beautiful? Is that skillful? What is it? Is it just a blur of compulsion, habit? I do this this way because I've always done it this way. I, they want me to. I've got to. I am, you know, stuck. Mm. So if it arises with that, mm. then, you know, it's going to carry through. Ceasing, passing of things, getting to the end of a day, end of a sitting, end of a breath, end of a thought, end of a meal, end of the washing up. Pause. What's the result of all that? How is it now? Not how am I doing, but just how is it now? At this particular moment, the energies sort of die down. Feeling, oh, yeah. uh uh-huh. Perhaps feeling a little happy or pleased or relaxed or disappointed or something. Restless. Residue. So just making a point, beginnings, endings, being clear. It's easiest often to contemplate the endings because the endings are slower than the beginning is often a, a, a kind of a jump there is the endings of things, what's there, what's the residue of that. And if you're doing, practicing anapanasati, then you have a very good model of pausing before the breathing, breath comes in, following through the end of a breath, then the beginning of the out-breath, ending of the out-breath, Beginning of the in-breath, end of the in-breath, beginning of the out-breath. And you notice, say, that your attention goes from being what seems to be a point, moving impression on the breathing of the breath, into something that seems just like a, a field. I call it a field. It's a, a, a certain open space. Hmm? You know, come to the end of that particular point, it's faded away and you just, uh-huh. You know, I don't know if he, when I was a youngster, we had televisions in those days, I don't know what they do now, we had only one or two channels in those days. And you, at the end of the day, you switch the television off and this, you get this little screen, the picture on the screen would just shoot down to a, a little white spot. And you can watch that white spot Fading out. <laughs> I tell you, we were, <laughs> not, you know, we were quite uh, not very intense in terms of our screen usage. You just sit and watch that white spot disappear. Oh, that was marvelous! A miracle of a television, you know. <laughs> and you switched it on. It took just a couple of seconds before the image kind of really came into place. And you watch it arise, you know. It sort of form itself up, and, uh-huh, and you switch it off, and then a little white spot. You watch that spot. Didn't realise I was meditating. <laughs> <laughs> the age of eight or whatever it was, <laughs> and then just sitting watching this empty screen. <laughs> uh, so, like the breathing, you know, in a breath. Now, naturally, you know, the instinct is. Or the habit, when the, you know, get an empty space, it immediately fills up with one's preoccupations. So we're doing those kind of purification, cleaning, renunciant practices. So there can be that, those moments when it's quite open. There's a little bit of something, you know, you know residue of some kind, but it's fairly, um, um, subtle or fairly 
uh, clear. It's not intense, huge amounts of stuff coming in. And whatever the content, you want to make it the content is okay, so you can be aware of just the nature of the boundary, the field that it's occurring in, like the container, you could say. Awareness. Hmm. So you get the activities, the felt stuff, and then the awareness of that. Your awareness is like that through which the process can occur, and the felt things are the process, the wave running through. We want to find our stability and our clarity and our happiness, not in terms of the wave process, but in terms of the knowing of that process, the awareness of that process, which is a field awareness rather than a point awareness. In other words, it's no specific location. It's not an object in the ordinary sense of the word. It's uh, like, you know, it doesn't separate itself from other things. It just and actually that, 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 is, that can be very secure because, you know, as you develop that or you incline towards that, and you keep that going also with the purification practices, the cleaning practices, then you begin to find something that actually is a safe, is a steady, is a comfortable way of abiding place for one's heart, mind. And all kinds of things can move through that. You don't, and you're just working with what jars or what snags. You know, the patterns that snag, urgency, uh, chaos, uh, poignancy, uh, relationships, where they, where they, 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 they catch, with a sense of got to change, like do something, make something, have something happen, you know, something going wrong, mm-hmm. something might be. I mean, when we contemplate, we really practice with that field, where the field. And fields is a useful reference, but uh, of course there are many of them. You could say the body is a field, which are you know, holding the frame of the body, all kinds of sensations and impressions and energies can arise. The field of the mind, which is huge. Mm. And they're interconnected. But the field of Dhamma, its boundary, if you like, its definition is that which arises, passes. This is the principle of uh, conditionality. So it's expressed in succinctly when there is this, this this is present. When there is not this, this is not present. So that's very much the present moment. No rhinoceroses. Um, Until I spoke the word, suddenly a rhinoceros appeared as soon as I spoke the word. Magic, isn't it? Three-headed rhinoceroses, you know, suddenly they have come in. So you can see that but when it's not there, it isn't there, you know. So that sense of momentary presence. Then secondarily, with the arising of this, is the arising of that. When this doesn't arise, that doesn't arise with the ceasing of this, is the ceasing of that. So it's more consequential. What gives rise to what? So you want to have both of those. In some ways, it's just that, you know, noticing or being limiting your awareness. So, because there isn't any, not looking at football matches or whatever, there isn't that particular thing happening. There isn't the disturbance that aroused by that. 
that sense of cleaning away, recognizing so much of one's uh, uh, personal history is there because we keep holding it. We could drop some of it, a bit of it, more of it. Hmm? When you're not, when there isn't there, this weight does not occur. This heaviness does not occur. This urgency does not occur. It can be that kind of letting go in the present. We're saying even just for a, a few moments. And then what engenders with the arising of what is the arising of that. And from that particular core uh, equation, if you like, you get the whole build-up of dependent origination. With the arising of clinging and, and craving, there's the arising of suffering. With the ending of clinging and craving, there's the ending of suffering. Mm-hmm. Or even more fundamentally, with the arising of ignorance, there's the arising of suffering. With the ceasing of ignorance, ceasing of suffering. And ignorance is what? Ignorance is the non-apprehension of the Four Noble Truths. So again, it's that particular thing. So inappropriate attention. So attention that's geared towards clinging, having, becoming, owning, possessing, repudiating, rejecting. That is going to be the rising of suffering. And you just keep checking it out. And is it, where is it possible to relinquish and again we're not relinquishing topics so much as the energies and the attitudes that go along with them we're not you know annihilating people but the clinging to it we're not annihilating the future but the clinging the anxiety the urgencies of it and how is this done so just you realize one point is that whatever, whenever there is a clinging, uh, you know, then that becomes a point. That becomes a focal point. One starts to operate around that. That becomes the focal point. The I am occurs, happening to me, myself, I have to, that occurs. So these are the signs. Selfhood, suffering, permanence. Something is there solidly, there's a sense of stress with it, and there's an I am with it. These are the three mistaken perceptions, mistaken views. So with insight, so with You know, with the concentration practice, you're changing your object. So it's much more when that doesn't happen, when when there can be focus on something, you know, bodily, calming, then this doesn't happen. The agitation, the memories, the irritations, the pains, and so don't happen. So that's that, isn't it? But of course we recognize, well, yeah, but that's only, that's useful indeed because you begin to see how relative one's world is. How much of it is carried into the present moment rather than innately existing. How much of it is brought in through particular psychological activities. And then secondarily, the causality of what brings things in. We open our eyes, the nature of the eyes is to see forms. We open our ears, the nature of the ears is to hear sounds. They definitely, there's something out there definitely generating them, isn't there? Or acting as a contributor to that. Mm-hmm. Open our eyes, there are tangible forms, visible forms, olfactory forms, auditory forms, 
and so something arises. Interesting enough, I reckon that actually most of our apparent external sense world is built by the brain. The eyes don't see what I'm seeing. They see a whole blurry data of, of colors and the brain assembles it into um, this appearance. So what do you think's there? Hmm. And yet it kind of works. But you look at something like um, an image in a mirror. Look at yourself in the mirror to have a shave or clean your teeth or whatever. Works, doesn't it? Piece of glass, silver back on it. See yourself really well. Where do you think that image in the mirror is? Is it in the glass? (laughs) Take a photograph of it, you won't see it. Is it in your mind? No, because you can't see it without the glass. Is it somewhere in between the two? Find a point. Where is it? (laughs) Where is that image? A thing we can use every day and rely upon. Does it exist? Does it not exist? Where is it happening? It's your mirage. Where's that? Where's the horizon? Running towards it, you never get there. And yet, we call it the world of appearance. Not actually of fundamental realities, but of appearances. And rather like trying to pinpoint that image in the mirror you know, you, you, or run to the horizon you, you can't, it can't be held it's appearance appearance only it can't be held and yet you look in a mirror that's definitely me you know, look in a mirror and think oh I don't like the look of that <laughs> a lot of identification with that image isn't it Hide it up. So the bits you see, the bits your attention goes towards, the, or the bits you don't like, or whatever, suddenly become very strong. Are they there? Hmm. Even more important, you know, there is something to generate that appearance. The eye, there are things that generate visible forms or an objective basis for visible forms, an objective basis for auditory forms. What about mental forms? Why don't, where do you think thoughts are? Where are they? Where are memories? Where are they kept? Do they have any objective basis at all? They're subjectively generated through process of mind, interest, shaping things up, translating bodily experiences, into moods and emotions. The sankara, generated, created, conditioned, fabricated, formed, put together. Mm. So we contemplate, you know, forms are forms, 
mental forms, visual forms, auditory forms, the world of appearance, just knowing is a world of appearance, not of actuality, helps to just lighten up the grip on that. And then really the point is, don't let the appearance be what it is. Notice what goes along with it. The distaste or the agitation or the fondling. Could that, recognizing that whatever appears is the nature to disappear, doesn't that help with the agitation, the overwhelm, the fascination, the fondling? What would we like if we that particular piece of activity could relax. And this is where the whole thing dependent arising can unravel. It's like a tangled knot. And you're trying to find the beginnings, the end of it, it's all just so bound up, it's difficult to find beginnings of the tangle. But this is like you know, like the the light blade that just cuts, it cuts place of clinging. I am craving. I want. I don't want. Feeling. This is happening to me. So these are, these are typically the places where you you bring those four, the blade of the four noble truths. Nothing can be clung to. There isn't somebody to defend or get right, to be right or wrong. There isn't somebody there. This is just an appearance in the mirror. And as we meditate and contemplate, we have the time to, to really work on some of that. You know, and especially the ones that become like life messages. I am. You know, treasured, defended, held. And the greatest treasure we have is our suffering. The most tenaciously hold on to. The field of Dhamma is the place where that can unravel. It's not a point, it's not an object, it's not a thought, it's not a belief, not a physical location, although those may help us to arrive at that, you know, to, to, to... just come out of the trance. It's that sense of widening into the field of Dhamma. That which arises, passes, conditions are unsatisfactory, not given to finding completion, finality, settledness. That's their nature. Is it always wavy? You know, you get to a calm place and then wait for the next wave to come through. (laughs) There'll be one. Probably a few kind of swishing around, sloshing around. Doesn't happen. Go to the top of a mountain, you know, get annoyed by the crows or something. And uh, the self, 
the satisfied self does not occur. So this is our field, and that's both a meditation, but it's also the more that becomes integrated, you realize you can't really approach living from those bases without experiencing these stuck um, states. Living from a sense of I am is going to be a problem. But still there can be the rising of agency, intentions, actions. But living from the sense of I am, what I want to do, what I want to be, I'm this and that, is going to be a problem. So we live in, in, in interdependence. What conditions are supported now? What conditions are not occurring now? It'd be nice if they did, but they're not. Mm. And you need kind of that quality, that openness, that renunciation has its own potency to calm, to gladden. Mm. You know, it's livable. So, notice the arising, noticing the passing. What are you left with when a thought ends? When a meal ends? When walking meditation ends, what are you left with? What's the residue that kind of echoes? Can that you know, be allowed to echo, pass through? What gets us in? What's the in, the instigator, the activity, the agent? Is that what's that accompanied by? And note the point. Can we come from a point to a field, from an object to what the object sits within, which is where all these uh, unconscious factors occur and where they can be cleared. 